we see ourselves oftentimes as, as doing something beneficial, whereas that's not what is being perceived by whatever species is doing their thing. So the first story that I'm going to essentially tell you about is the this, this story where there's extraterrestrial beings who are considered part of the universal immune system. Now, if you have a species that is behaving like a bacterial infection, then it gets targeted by the immune system of the universe at large. At the same time as you have an extraterrestrial being who's like, you know what, there's so much value in humanity, we can make humanity choose. So even they are playing into this choice point where you've got, you know, these extraterrestrial beings who are trying to prove that the human race is essentially gone rogue and is a cleanup species, meaning it's what we have to take out of the picture of the rest of the system because the amount of collective asking from Earth, plant kingdom, mineral kingdom, animal kingdom that are asking for us to go is huge. It's like a signal throughout the universe. Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. Thank you very much for coming and you're in for a treat today. Today, I have Teal Swan on the show. She is an international speaker. She is a best-selling author, and her mission is to transform human suffering to an empowered and authentic life. Man, I mean, she has an incredible YouTube presence. She really speaks to the human experience in a way that I don't know anybody does. Her understanding of it and her ability to put it into words and use examples so that we regular humans can understand these aspects of ourselves and this experience of being human in a way to help us progress and evolve and step out of suffering and to understand the experience more. It's, it's incredible. I recommend anybody watch her on YouTube. She has a huge YouTube channel, tons of videos, anything that you could possibly want to watch a video on, she has it. It was tough for me today in the episode to be able to speak to a lot of new things because she literally like covers everything and I've watched so much content, but we did. We got into some areas that I have not heard her speak about before, but of course we did talk about relationships. We talked about the human experience. We just started off with what is love, right? A simple question talked about what we're here for, talked about source energy and the how that plays into our experience as humans, talked about extraterrestrials. It's basically like, if you've never heard of this before, you could look it up. It's basically like talking to the Akashic Records live and in person, um, which means it's basically the information of everything. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for watching. If you like what you see um, and you enjoy these episodes, please make sure that you click the subscribe button so that you'll get notifications for when more of these fun, fun episodes come out. I'm very excited when Jen said, she's like, I think we have Teal on the hook a little. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> I was like, she's like, I thought you might like that. I'm like, I don't like that. I love that. I have been listening to you for a really long time and it's um, the way that you put things and the clarity and the examples you use. It's just, it's kind of second to none to a lot of people out there that are trying to explain the human experience. <laughs> Thank you. Does that come naturally to you? Yeah. Why do you think it's so natural? You know, <laughs> I'm a really, really highly intellectual person. You know, we've got these different qualities, things like wisdom, things like intellect. My intellect level is like really, really high. And that makes it a lot easier, I think, to dissect things. And also it helps to be able to visually see in somebody's energy field, whether they're getting something or not. And that helps you to kind of make micro adjustments for the sake of understanding. Wow. <laughs> well, that's amazing because you're are you making, are you able to make adjustments for a collective understanding of oh, a yeah. topic? Okay. Not just like the, like for instance, me, if I'm getting it, but a collective audience. Yep. Can you tell how big the collective audience is as well? I mean, depends what I'm working with, but often. Yeah. Fascinating. I thought that the first thing we'd start off with is something really sweet and lovely and about your book coming up, which is called how to love yourself, which I think sounds like an incredible remedy for just about everything in the world going on, perhaps. So I thought I'd start off with just kind of like a big question and just ask first off, what is love? What is love? Okay. Love is to take another as a part of oneself. We, of course, don't really have that understanding of love, even though that's essentially what's happening when we feel love, because we like to confuse 
that word with so many different states. And I think one of the hardest parts about the English language is that we're just so limited, you know, the word love in other cultures, they usually have so many other words for it, you know, so you can start to differentiate between, you know, what love as a concept is versus what this romantic love is versus what this friendship love is. So that's part of why we get so lost in the weeds, especially in the Western culture. So to take another as a part of oneself so that there is essentially no, no genuine separation is what love is. And all of these things we see as a byproduct of love are just a byproduct of taking the other as a part of the self. So like when we do that, when we take somebody as a part of ourselves, their best interest is no longer in, like separable from our best interest. So it's not possible then to act against that person without wounding ourselves at the same time, which is what makes beauty or love so beautiful. And it naturally gives rise to things like trust, you know? So usually when somebody says, you know, I've fallen out of love with you, or I don't feel like you love me right now, it's because they don't feel like they're being taken as a part of the other person. They feel instead like in that relationship, there's a separation, which is making it so both they and the other person are in what we call an ego state. Mm -hmm. um, they perceive themselves to be separate. And so they can start to play a zero sum game, you know, mm -hmm. where I can act in my best interest, regardless of what's in your best interest. And then we're not in a love state. <laughs> If I don't love an aspect of myself, it's always it comes to self, right? If I don't love that aspect of myself and then I see somebody, some kind of mirroring or reflection of that, is it actually feeling like that other person doesn't love that aspect or is it really just because I'm not, I don't love that aspect? Both. So this is, this is another thing that I think makes it, people very confused because we live in this mirror hologram essentially, but in this mirror hologram, it's like the reflection is also real. It's not false. It's not just a reflection. So you're seeing a perfect replica on the external as you've got on the internal. So that means that like, you know, you may reject an aspect of self, but so do they. You know? That same one or just something different? It depends on the circumstance. You know, like I'll get, I'll, I'll get more clear. So let's say that you yourself have an issue with your anger, right? Mm -hmm. You'll be a match to somebody else who also has an issue with anger. And so you're going to get it both from your internal and from the external while your internal part is like, this is not acceptable. We should be able to regulate ourselves right now. You'll get a partner who's like, I am not okay with your anger. This is really immature, you know, or whatever it is. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Because that's familiar. Is that like the like attract like kind of situation or is it just because we find something similar in someone else that resonates with us. No, it's because we live in a universe that's based off of the law of mirroring, which is what many people call the law of attraction. This was designed as a 360 degree mirror hologram for the sake of the perception of expansion. Mm -hmm. So it, it like, you cannot escape the fact that you will see on the external, whatever is on the internal. Mm -hmm. That's an, it's like a law of our time space reality. Otherwise nobody would come down to this earth. So why don't people love themselves? because of the process of socialization. So to understand that process, we have to go back to the childhood experience where when we're in an environment like this as a social species, there's like a code of conduct for how we have to live so as to coexist as a group. And there are more exalted forms of this, but right now we're living in a real shadow form of this and have been forever where in childhood, a child has to be raised up into this you know, position to understand what is acceptable and what is unacceptable what will get them rejected and what will get them accepted. And we all go through this process of socialization if we're part of human society. But it is that process that teaches us what aspects of ourselves, like I said, are going to get us pushed away. And in a social group, which I think it's really important that people accept that they're a social species. You know, it's, I, As I go around the planet, it's been very difficult to try to get people to under, understand what they need and what's going wrong because they can't even see themselves clearly. You know, when, when you're stepping in from an outside perspective, if you take humans as a species, it's a group species. It's like a herd species. And that means that the well-being of the individual human is inseparable from the group. This presents an issue with socialization because our survival as humans is so linked to our connection to other people that we actually will play, play, play like this internal triangulation game so as to stay connected with the people upon whom our life depends. And so it's like, what I like to do is take people back in time to think about themselves as a tiny infant. If I was to take a tiny infant and if I was to go put them outside, they're dying. We are so 
completely dependent for so long. And even when we are able to meet our needs, technically, our well-being is still dependent upon the connection with the group. Mm -hmm. So it's important for people to first get, I am a group species mm -hmm. and therefore my well-being is not independent of my connection to other people. So in childhood, when, when you've got that fundamental aspect of yourself and that we could consider more primal element of the nervous system hooked into the group, when you've got mom or dad or any member of society, especially an adult who's telling you, and it doesn't need to be verbal, like this can be, you know, through their words, through their actions, through a look, you know, if they're doing anything in response to us, we learn very quickly, good, bad, right, mm -hmm. wrong, threat to me, not. And so when I, I'm talking about this internal triangulation dynamic, let's talk about triangulation. Triangulation is essentially where I try to establish closeness to the exclusion of. Mm. So we see this in our social groups, like, you know, as girls, like we've, you know, how it is to kind of be like, oh my gosh, you know, Michelle, she was like totally unfair to you just then. So it's a, it's a way to sort of push somebody away to, so as to develop rapport. And we have this exact same relationship dynamic going on, but in the internal world. And this is where self-hate begins. Mm. When we perceive that an aspect of ourselves is not going to be accepted by the group that we're around, we push that aspect of ourselves away so as to gain closeness with those people in our lives. Mm -hmm. So it's an internal triangulation game against mm -hmm. certain aspects of self. And to the degree that we experience an aspect of ourselves causing pain for us, we will experience the same degree of hatred towards that part because underneath all hatred is pain. And then it's a lifelong process of pushing that aspect away, trying to suppress it, trying to deny it, trying to cut it off. You know? and, and this is really where we can't stay in this integrated state. We can't take that part of us as a part of us ourselves. And that is where, you know, to take that definition of love beyond, you know, the other, that's where our self-love falls apart. Ideally thinking that if you loved all aspects of yourself, then that would sort of be the cure to yeah. loving others and, and, and feeling the love of others as well? I don't like to differentiate between the two at a certain level. The point at which to make something about the self versus the others is the point at which you're looking to get somebody into a state of empowerment. There's something inherently disempowering about depending on the external to make a change for yourself to feel good. So that's the point at which we start to look at at concepts like loving myself makes it so the external can love me. But if we go to a higher dimensional level, you see that there's actually no difference between the external and the internal. So loving other is loving the self. There is nothing but self-love. Mm. So I think it's important to sometimes to like take the pressure off having to love the self so as to get love from the external, even though we recognize this mirror construct, there ultimately is no difference. Mm-hmm. It's just, it would benefit us to not be walking around in the state of disintegration, to not be walking around in a state of fragmentation where we've got this internal war going on. Mm -hmm. We're all looking for internal peace. And you also hear that, especially in the self-development fields and in the spiritual field, you just hear this like catchphrase, in, inner peace, inner peace, like all over the place. And it's like, what the hell is that? That's a state where you don't have an aspect of self against another aspect. That's a state where there's a recognition of value in all aspects and the integration occurs so that you can draw from the best aspects of all of these parts of self. And you've got a harmonious system going on rather than war within the system. So is the concept of trying to heal the self, heal the trauma, heal the wounds, uh, you know, cultivate your relationship with your inner child, all those kinds of things, is that an old sort of methodology of, of evolving? And should it really just be shifting your consciousness to a level that is just accept understanding that everything is a part of us? I don't see them as exclusive from one another. I feel like that is the most profoundly healing step that you can take. It's just when you start to look at the process of self-development or the process of healing through that lens of integration, you don't fall into as many pitfalls as when you're focusing on, I need to fix myself or heal myself or, you know, do whatever. Cause even the process of self-healing and the process of shadow work can become so incredibly abusive. <laughs> it can become like, I need to fix this part of mine because the, the background noise is because it's not okay. You know? 
Yeah. And then it's like, it just becomes this, you're almost on the treadmill that never ends because you can't hate yourself into needing to change and love yourself at the same time. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, this seems like a, it seems like, um, I'm not gonna, it sounds, it feels like a setup to fail kind of existence, the human experience. Really? It feels really tricky and it feels yeah. like, you know, there's a lot of confusion, suffering and not being able to see the self and not being able to understand really what's going on. There's, I mean, the human experience is a whole bunch of it's your fault, not mine. And, and, and it feels like that's just, is that the way it's designed to be to help us grow and evolve? No. What no. happened then? Where did we go wrong? Resistance. Human beings are more capable of going into a state of resistance than almost any other species. And part of that is because you could consider mankind to be a manifestation of the mind of God. Let's like say those words, you know, so if we're looking at source, which we could define as the collective consciousness of all things in existence. Each species is essentially a manifestation of an aspect of what we would call source. Mm -hmm. So mind is actually what human beings have manifested as a result of. And that makes things very tricky because while you have all of these amazing capacities that come along with that, you also have these incredible shadows that come along with that. Like, for example, you know, you can see the beauty of being a species that has the capacity to help source define itself. A species that has come down with this intention of helping source become aware. You know, the problem with that, though, is to become aware of the self is to have an ego. So you see the, the human is in a state of ego more so than almost any other species because of this very same trait. And I, I think it's very important to realize that everything comes with contrast. So every time we have like this incredible you know, ability to the flip side of that is some kind of a shadow that can get us into a lot of trouble. And what we're seeing with humanity is this massive trouble with, uh, you know, the shadow aspect of the manifestation of what they're what makes them so brilliant ultimately. So where does the shadow come from? Unawareness. That's all the shadow is. Mm -hmm. It's not even like it comes from anywhere. It's just like what is not exposed to, to the consciousness. And why is it that we, is this part of fragmentation? Is that basically, and when is fragmentation a part of the shadow? Like does yes. the shadow emerge when we fragment? Yes. In a human. Yes. It's it, we, whatever. So this is how to, how to put this. Like, let's say that you're growing up in your childhood and anger is not okay in your, in the upbringing that you have. So you will go and do your best to suppress, deny, disown, push away from your consciousness, that aspect of yourself. A part of what goes along with that is to, to make it become shadow, meaning it's not what we are conscious of anymore. Mm -hmm. And the mind essentially does that because it's an efficiency machine. And it's trying to, it's trying to do the best that it can with the directives that it's given. So it's like, this gets us in trouble. But the problem is like within each one of these, these shadows, should we call it, is something really, really valuable. We call this shadow gold. So like within your anger is the capacity to know where your limits are. With no anger, there is no limit. <laughs> sure. So, so let's say you buried your limits at the same time as you've buried your anger. And so all of a sudden you're unaware of all your limits as well. That's going to be great in relationships and great, you know, walking around your day-to-day -day life and whatever it is. So yeah, that, that process of fragmentation that occurs as a result of splitting off from and then suppressing, denying, disowning the aspect of self makes it go into this place within a person where they're no longer aware of it. That's the shadow. <laughs> So one of maybe the most important videos I've watched of yours was when you said the simple sentence that what you judge, you deny. And I was like, or something to that degree. It was a whole, a whole video about that. And I have used that and told that to so many people because it's such a simple technique. Is this a technique or what is a technique to be able to recognize these shadow aspects to ourselves so that we can find the gold and we can merge and, and heal these fragmented parts of us that we don't want to, we have, we, pu we pushed down or didn't, weren't valuable growing up. It's one of the techniques. Part of, again, what's so difficult about this line of work is that we have so many different tools that we can use for integrating the shadow. <laughs> we're doing, we're essentially doing shadow work using any of these tools. Anytime we become conscious of anything, 
So, I mean, some things that fit into the realm of shadow work, you can do parts work, you can do inner child work, you can do soul retrieval work, you can do work with emotions, you can do breath work, you can do meditation, mm -hmm. you could do work with shamanic medicines, and all of these could be considered working with the shadow. Uh -huh. So it's really about finding what's the best tool for the person given the specific circumstance that they're in. And there, but there are some, you know, tools, which I consider like for just the average Joe, that's not really into this, but like, just to have one tool, my favorite is for them to tap into their emotions. And I know that sounds like very baseline, but I got to tell you the honest truth. Most people are walking around, not tapped into their emotions and emotions are the carriers of personal truth. So if we have this capacity to, to practice recognizing the somatic reaction in our body when an emotion arises and then essentially turning all of our attention to that emotion so as to become intimate with it. And by intimate, I mean, see it, feel it, hear it, understand it. Then what'll happen is the personal truth will essentially come into the conscious awareness, almost like a bubble popping. Hmm. You're like, oh, I see it. Okay. So that happened. That caused me to feel this way. This is my personal truth about this circumstance. Now, what am I going to do from an objective perspective about that personal truth? I could do anything with it. I could, I could, this could be telling me, you know, looking at this, that I need to communicate this. It could mean that I need to change the way I'm thinking about this. I mean, there's all kinds of things we could do on a mental, emotional, even physical level in response to that personal truth. Mm -hmm. So that's the low hanging fruit, honestly, when it comes to the shadow is to pay attention to what your emotions are saying. Uh, yes, but I don't even think that's simple enough for some. Yeah. To be honest, I think even just, you know, what are your emotions telling you? I'm pissed right now. Right. Like, I mean, so then if so somebody, somebody says like, I'm sad, I'm mad. I mean, these are, this is like the first answer. Right. And sometimes that's as far as it gets. They can't feel their body. They don't know where it sits in their body. They, they don't know what to do next. So for someone who is new and intrigued, what is the, like, what is the, what is the line of questioning? How do you keep peeling it away to get down to the core. The protocol actually should start with only doing about a week or two weeks of, of simply noticing the somatic sensations in your body. So it's, it's tapping back into the body because an emotion will always show up on a somatic level. And oftentimes like, well, you know, we don't talk about this because we just label an emotion. It's, it's sort of like, you know, anger may come up in terms of flushing, in terms of a sensation of constriction or buzzing. And it's those types of sensory experiences, which we need to recognize again. And so what I, the protocol I usually give people who have an issue with this is that I'll, I'll have them have like a little notebook or something with them. This is the emotional notebook. And for a week or two weeks, we pick, depending on what a person wants to commit to, every time they, they like set their timer for like maybe 10 minutes or like what person might do it every hour if they have a really busy life. When that timer goes off, they do a check-in. So it's almost like a, a very short body scan. What are the sensations that I'm feeling in my body? And then they are writing those sensations down. And of course, anytime they really know that they're feeling a sensation, like let's say it's triggered or whatever, mm -hmm. the same thing. So they're writing down just the first two weeks. They're just writing down what the somatic sensation is. Then mm -hmm. the next two weeks we go and we progress it. So they, they become attuned again to, to the emotions within their body as they occur. Then the next step is you add the, what emotion might this be? And I, I'll like usually print off an entire list for people or have them do that themselves so they can look at the like, okay, buzzing, constriction. The word that matches with this is frustration. So they'll mm -hmm. like write down frustration. And that, that's all we do for like the next week or two weeks. Then we add another layer again. So you are like making it so they're so good at this that they can then add things without it just becoming this cluster, right? Sure. It's overwhelming. That next phase, that next layer that we add is is the why. Why am I feeling this? Mm. So it's then that they go, okay, so looking back, when did this come up in me? Was there anything that happened in my environment? So then they'll write it down, you know, this is why I'm feeling this way. And that's a very, very powerful um, practice because so many people are not even aware of the fact that something in their life had an effect on them in this way. Yeah. So and it also helps because we're, we're also in this pattern, you'll notice with people just constantly emotionally invalidating themselves. So that step helps to be like, wait a minute, there's a reason why I feel emotions. They just, just come out of nowhere, you know? <laughs> and then that, that, but yeah, then that last layer is, okay, so what is the personal truth? What is the personal truth about this situation? You know, it might be something like, I don't like being disrespected. Okay, that's interesting. So there's tons of exploration you could do there around the disrespect. 
Like you can, you can decide from that point. There's so many choice points. Like you can decide from that place of, I don't like disrespect. You can choose to go back into childhood. When was I, when did I feel disrespected in my life? Oh, wait, this is a chronic pattern. I always felt disrespected in my life. Okay. When was the first time? And like using that, you can actually go back and do a healing process around that original experience. Mm -hmm. And even that will bring you closer to personal truth and your limits and boundaries, which is, you know, essentially just a, a firm personal truth about who you will and won't be around, like what you will and won't tolerate. Also, I mean, another direction you could go with that is like, well, was I really disrespected? You can look at this from a more objective perspective where it's like, well, you're shifting the way you're thinking about this. Was I really disrespected? Or was it really the, you know, the, what is the truth of the situation? Is it that the person just was in a horribly bad mood and had literally nothing to do with me, you know? So you're sort of becoming more aware of what the reality of the situation is. And mm -hmm. through this exploration process, you come to, what that action step is, if okay. anything that needs to be taken. Sometimes that action step, let's call it, could just be changing the way you're thinking about the situation. Other times it's a conversation that you can have. But based on doing that, you're going to come at it from a totally different place. Not like, screw you, dude, you know. Um, you're going to come at it from this very objective place where it's like you're really setting down what your truth is in that relationship. Another thing could be we take an action that we would normally label an action, not like a conversation or like changing the way we we're thinking. You know, maybe I feel disrespected. It goes beyond a conversation and you literally walk out the door. I mean, there's a million actions you could take. It's just the goal is to become aware and objective enough that you can really make the right choice. Yeah. For yourself. Is that attunement? To becoming attuned to yourself? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned triggers, and I think that this is a word that is somewhat low-hanging fruit as well. I think people feel like this is something people have heard of at least, but they might not really understand it. And so maybe explaining and then the role. Like what what are the triggers for? Oh, I love this conversation. Okay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> a trigger is an emotional flashback. Okay, so let's talk about memory. When we experience something traumatic, memory is actually stored in a fragmented way. So fragmentation in and of itself, which is this act of splitting, and, and we could, part of that is compartmentalizing. This act of splitting is the primary coping mechanism for a human. And so that goes beyond just fragmentation of parts. It goes into fragmentation of you know, anything, memories included. So a memory that's super traumatic, when the brain can't really deal with the whole thing in a compartment, it will start to separate things out. It'll start to, to store the emotional aspect of that memory separate from the scent aspect of that memory, separate mm. from the visuals. And what's interesting about a physical human is that, and which is why I'm saying that tapping back into your emotions is one of the most important things you can do, just, which is the low hanging fruit when it comes to, you know, this whole process of self-healing, because the emotional aspect of memory is usually stored closer to the conscious mind than any other aspect. But it creates a conundrum where when, when we experience something that causes us to remember something, that's what we call it a trigger. It's like, a, oh, the memory's there. Um, then that, that very strong emotional aspect of memory is now back. And it's like, we're not really in the current moment. We're back in the trauma and essentially getting re-traumatized in the current moment. But a lot of us don't have any context for that because the brain stores it in such a separate way. Uh -huh. So we're like, what the hell is going on with me? You know, the example that I like to give is, let's say that you've got a, a woman who had sexual abuse and like, the, let's say the man who sexually abused her had a certain cologne he wore. So if, if her brain has done this and has stored everything in this way, then she may be just walking down an aisle and like, let's say another guy passes her with that same cologne out of nowhere, out of nowhere. She's like, you know, and it's a full blown emotional reaction. But of course, because she doesn't have the context, she's like, I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. Why am I having a panic attack? And then it starts to escalate because she's looking around going, there is <laughs> nothing happening. I need to see a psychiatrist, you know? So, so these, we all have these triggers, which are these emotional flashbacks. But what I'm trying to teach people in the world is that there is no part of the self, which is against the self. We have to profoundly understand this in order to get anywhere not just with a psyche, but with physical healing as well. So if the, if the body and the yourself doesn't ever actually do anything against you, and I'm going to make that statement very aggressively, mm -hmm. then what it means is that, you know, a flashback, even on a visual level is trying to call you back to something unresolved. 
And it's no different with a trigger. A trigger is trying to say, this is unresolved. I still need help. Eh," You know? So what the most powerful thing and important thing we can do is to actually go back to that. We go back to it on a conscious level and with choice so as to, you know, figure out what we need in order to heal from that. And I can simplify healing very quickly for people, which is to experience the opposite. So let's say that you have a broken bone, right? To heal is to mend the bone. If you have loneliness, to heal might be something like connection. And there may be some subtle variations over here based on what somebody experienced. You know, for one person who experiences this thing, that healing thing might be genuine empowerment. You know, or for, or for another person experiencing the same thing, it might be um, something like to have choice. But it's always something to the opposite side of the experience. It's what they what need was not met in that moment. Mm. And so it gives us this very, if we understand that, it gives us this very easy and understandable um, framework for which to go, oh, wait, what I needed in this moment because of this pain that I experienced is whatever this resource is. Now it's about what do I do with my mind, with my body that makes it so that I can actualize that the opposite of that experience. Is this the role? Is this a role of polarity? Is this, is this what polarity is for to get us to see things easier? Yes. Polarity and contrast. I like to use this word contrast because, um, you know, essentially contrast is what is creating expansion on our planet. It is the experience of the unwanted that pushes us in the direction of the wanted. And that movement to close that gap is what we call growth. We couldn't perceive any of that without it being this way. So contrast is really what gives rise to the growth experience, what gives rise to healing in the first place. Mm, I'm from my experience and the things that I've gone through in my life, especially a couple of years ago. And I guess in the last few years, the the more I experience something hard and difficult and painful and traumatic on some level, the more I feel the good. It's yep. like once I've felt the really bad, then all of a sudden joy becomes more accessible to me. Yes. Why the hell does it have to work like, or why does it? I mean, I guess I'm grateful, right? Because otherwise, you know, <laughs> I didn't get anything for it, right? Other than some sort of process that I'm learning, but explain that. Why is that so? The first thing I have to say to that is that universally speaking, just by virtue of having created this time-space reality, source itself is in the process of deciding whether this is the best construct for learning. Uh, so it's not like that's going to always Period? You mean across the board, like this is yeah. what's happening right now? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that is coming because of mankind. You know, M- mankind is questioning whether contrast is the basis upon which all expansion must occur, whether, and, and what's ironic is this question that's happening within the mind of source as a result of humankind questioning this to such an extreme degree is coming in part because you know, in this, in this type of reality where it's the external mirror, you know, what we're watching is that people often get stuck in it. So instead of being able to close that gap, it's like you almost get into this self-reinforcing loop where the reflection makes it worse. And then that making it worse makes the reflection worse. And so it's almost like you've got, you know, how this applies to the physical life is you got a girl who let's say was molested in her teen years. And, you know, based off of that feels distrustful around men based off of that, you know, takes some sort of a weird action and is a match to other men that are more dangerous. And then because of that, you know, let's say, let's say she has to cope with that by a sort of acclimatizing and turning off to red flags, you know, so now she doesn't notice she's in a dangerous situation. So now you've got a girl who like, not only was she's molested at this age, she's in an abusive relationship at this age, which just makes everything worse. And then, you know, it escalates to the point where this is a person who's murdered. So that dynamic that essentially is happening as a result of this construct is making for this big questioning, but setting that aside, that's kind of a fascinating topic in and of itself, though, to be honest. Yeah. Setting that one aside, what's important to know is that there is no con- capacity to conceptualize white without black. You actually can't. And whether that's a limit within the mind of source or not is still to be decided. But as of right now, it's a limit that source itself is experiencing is that one can only know the opposite from the context of whatever is polar, you know, site is. So like you cannot know what love is 
if you don't understand something like loneliness any more than a fish can understand what water is without the experience of air, it's not a thing you can understand, you know? I think a lot about like the sort of micro macro of things and even just talking about community and being in, in clumps of people. It's like that sells when you, you scientists look at how cancer works, it's loss of cell communication. And then I look at like the universe and I think to myself, we're, our, we're growing and expanding. The universe is growing and expanding. And it just all seems like there's some sort of micro macro, like it's just some sort of frequency vibration game that's just, I don't know, reverberating um, um, mathematically properly across all different planes. I don't know. I, it's just something I think about. Does that make any sense? Yeah. The mathematics of the universe is based on fractals and fractals is exactly what you're describing. <laughs> what is, what would blow? I mean, I look at this all the time. I remember, you know, walking down the beach and just seeing how the water drains off into the ocean and how it just looks like a canyon in a mountain range. Right. Yes. And you're like, this is just like the small version of the big version. Yep. Um, so maybe just like, how does fractals play in? What could, what could you, what could you tell us that's fractal in nature? Maybe other than everything. It's everything. Um, it's everything. <laughs> everything. So what, what are we like? What is this experience? What is, what is, what are we here for then? Well, are you talking about like life itself? I guess because if everything's just fractal in nature and it's just sort of perfect geometry happening all over the place, it I'm wondering where consciousness plays into it and our existence and what we're essentially here for. Why are we even able to quantify or question this? Because source itself is trying to know itself. And I, I think this is one of the most freeing answers if people really understand it, but it's also a terrifying answer. It's like, you know, that there's a terror in freedom and there's a terror in responsibility. And there's a terror for humans if they start looking at you know, this concept of source or God as if it's not this all-knowing being that already has everything planned out. When, when humans understand that source itself has a subconscious and does not know itself, it's like, oh no, we're out on a limb, but it gets even scarier when I tell you that every creature that has ever been, you know, created in existence, you know, it sources all there is. So it's essentially taking parts of itself and like, let's see all of the potentials of me. So as to become self-aware. So we are facilitating the self-awareness within source itself. Isn't that what we're our journey too? Yes. Fractals. The same journey. Cause it's fractals. just a fractal of source. Mm -hmm. <sighs> And so what's the end game for that? What, why would we know? Well, the game would be over, I guess. What, what would be over? What is over? What is over? Okay. So I'm going to, do you want me to catch you up to where source is right now? Are you interested in that? Love that. Okay. <laughs> I would love that. So, so source as a collective mind, let's say it is in a place where it, it has basically it's fragmented because of the concept of I. Like, you know, what am I? Uh-oh. You know, that word I essentially created this mass fragmentation within itself, where each element of that fragmented self is a fractal of itself, right? So what's really important to, to know about source is that it's, it's kind of gone with this process of like, all right, so let's see how many different aspects of myself I can create so as to see what I am. And then it realizes, wait a minute. In the act of even creating these, I am deciding what I am. And that is a never-ending process. So the source is already to the place where it realizes there's no end to this. It's no end to what it can create. And therefore, there is no end to what it is. It's an infinite game. Now, once source became aware of the fact that it was an infinite game, it's like, wait a second. So then, if there's no end to this, and I'm just creating whatever it is that I could perceive in myself, then the only reason once we come back to a state of, of integration, that means all, you know, when source fragments, the elements of source are imbued within these fractals. And this is a big problem in the universe right now because free will is an element of source. 
And so when it fragmented, free will was an element of all the aspects of itself. So it doesn't matter whether the, the overall sort of has this understanding that process of fragmentation made it so that each element must choose with its free will back into that state of oneness. So this is why we're still in this game, even after source itself as this collective has realized this is because just because source realized it doesn't mean that all aspects of itself are on board with that yet. They st are still choosing separation, but that aside, you know, source is at this place where it's like, you know, if the game really isn't to know myself, cause that's an infinite game, whatever I create, I am then the only reason essentially to create after the process of reintegration is by choice. I choose what I am. Then what are we, I mean, that's as far as sources right now. It's just right. It's just at that point in time. And what if it decides that, um, what if source decides that choosing is not fun? It's um, I could just keep choosing forever. What's the point? I mean, I, I, if source is literally at the, at the point where that's not even a question, like if you have a choice in the act of choice, you would never choose something that isn't fun. So like that question almost doesn't exist in a position of choice. I see. I see. But like, you know, so essentially what, the source is not at the place where it has reintegrated to see what all of it collectively will choose together. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's had this realizations and now it's stuck, quote unquote, in this process of trying to get all these fragmented aspects of self to choose back to a state of oneness so mm -hmm. that it can make an integrated choice about what it is and what its next step is. Mm -hmm. Is is that aspect playing out in us as well as far as choice and choosing? We're all trying to decide, are we going to come together? Are oh, we and because the universe got to this point already, the level of pressure cooker, this is why most of us were nervous. I mean, ultimately, looking from a higher perspective, things are a little different. You get up there and you look down and you're like, wow, it's beautiful. Okay, so um, that's not how it feels in the physical. The way it feels in the physical is one source is like, wait a minute. I'm now in a position where all aspects of me have to choose back into a state of oneness so I can make an integrated choice. Oh man, was the heat turned up like, ah, oh, you know, just to the point where the, the pressure being put on like each individual aspect to choose out of a state of what we call narcissism, to choose out of this, this egoic state where there is a separated selfhood that, it, that kind of like has a well-being separate from the collective. That's like not even a choice you can make anymore without consequences so high that, you know, from here in your physical life, you're just kind of like, what bed do I hide under? You know? but, but yeah, we're in a pressure cooker right now and everybody is being forced to choose. So going to the smaller factor, which is you and your individual life, each person in within this system right now is being put in a position to have to choose. Are you going to continue to play a zero sum game? Are you going to continue to act like a, a cancer cell? Mm -hmm. There will be consequences, but it's not personal. It's like a mirror. It's like, you're going to act that way. Then let's see the consequences because there's a, we live in a, we live in a cause and effect based universe. You can't get out of that. And it's not even personal. It's not like sources like this mother or father figure that's like, huh. you know, I really don't think that was great of you. So here's your punishment. I'm doling. It's not like that. It's just, you know, in a mirror based hologram, if you behave in a way that is to not consider the other, have fun with a life where you are not considered. So that's the choosing. Yep. That's the, po that's the point we're at. That's the choosing. You can yep. choose to play along or, or integrate or, or not. Yeah. And so for those who decide not to is what is that outcome versus, um, and maybe this kind of plays into a question I have that I've heard about, um, or for the people who decide to integrate, is this part of a new earth? Is that even a real thing? What, what yes, is it's real what, thing? What, yes. Okay. It's a part of the new earth and it's a very real thing. If you're a person who essentially chooses separation, that's the choice we're in. If you're a person who chooses separation, the level of suffering that you will experience is extreme mm. and you will potentially be choosing death because you're, you're essentially making a choice to stay out of alignment with the rest of source. You know, when source makes a movement, it like all of the fractals of itself are now in this pressure cooker to create the same movement. If you don't do that, you're against the current of the universe. So that creates massive amounts of suffering. And if you don't close that gap quick enough, it means death, which is why we're headed towards this very difficult time period where so many people will be choosing off of earth, you know, and not even like when I say choosing, I don't even mean on like a conscious level. It's a very like subconscious choosing. It's not like people are saying, I want this. It's just sort of determinism. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and the source is in a position which everybody is when they're dealing with a genuine narcissist, which is like, I can do nothing with this. Like you've decided for a bubble, everything I tell you, you won't take in, you're going to reframe everything. So it's like, you're having to essentially let them go so far off by themselves that eventually that state causes so much pain that they choose with their own free will to come back. You can't chase them anymore. Mm. It's almost like you have to give them permission to separate so far. Mm. Yeah. It's just becoming a more extreme version of the game. Yep. Okay, so let's let's talk about how this plays into the new earth. If people are put in this pressure cooker and they choose, you know what? I'm sick of this safe separation. I am sick of this crap. I'm sick of suffering. Like what I'm wanting is to become fully conscious. What I'm wanting is to become integrated with the rest of the system. And when I say that, I don't, I, I don't just mean humanity. I mean the system of the earth we're living on and ultimately the system of the universe itself. Then we step into what people are calling this new earth, which is essentially the conscious humanity. So when we're talking about the new earth, we're talking about the final state of a redeemed humanity. Now, a lot of different um, cultures have been talking about that. A lot of different religions have been talking about that. Mm. But what I look at with the new earth is these three qualities. The first being renovation, the first being restoration, or second being restoration, the third being this restructuring. And these three R's make it so that the, the painful qualities of your human existence, we could say suffering, we could say, you know, a Christian might call it sin, which is to be out of alignment. You know, sin, to sin was actually originally um, something that came from archery, like to sin is to miss the mark. Huh. So, so those of us who are not really into the, the sort of Christian narrative, who are more into the spiritual narrative, you can look at a, a, the concept of sin as being out of alignment with something. So it's mm. our, our capacities or, or sorry, our issue with being out of alignment with the greater system is something that does not exist in the state of the new earth. So that's mm. the absence of sin, the absence of, of suffering, and some even project the absence of death. And that's a potential. There is some value to be held in the switching of perspectives. But if you are so in alignment that you're constantly lining up with the expansion path, there is no reason for death. So what you see is the exalted form of the human. And this exalted form of the human is reflected within society. And when you have the exalted form of the human society, you have what so many people call utopia. It's nothing more than a conscious humanity where the delusion of separateness is no longer exist. Is this something where we all live on the same planet together physically, yeah. but consciously yes. in a different place? Yes. And the reason that I say that is because the, the people who are talking about this concept of the new earth not being something that takes place physically on earth are in resistance to physicality. Source itself is not in resistance to physicality. There is so much ecstasy to be experienced in the physical life, you know, and it's just going to get better. The same as like, if I was to take you right now and put you back in the 1600s and to see what the medical practices are back then, you're like, eh, you know, it's barbaric. So to, to that, to them in that age, this seems like a dream. And I and I'm I'm like sort of trying to explain that sort of the pain that we have with our physical experience doesn't really exist in this new earth experience. Because mm -hmm. like even if there if if you were to get out of alignment, you know, we're looking at progress in the future, and that's not even all the way to the new earth, like progress in the future where you get sick and literally you pass through a light that's able to reset everything. There's no pain involved in this process. It's, oh, today I manifested cancer cells. I passed through this light. Now they're gone. You know, and stuff that most of us cannot conceptualize of from this place that we're in today. It makes me think of some stories that I've heard from other people about extraterrestrials and things that have come to earth that they were supposed to build and then it didn't get to happen and <laughs> things like that. And so then it makes me wonder about, about the role, about... I'm guessing extraterrestrials exist, other entities. Yes. Right? Um, I figured that was the case. Um, I didn't want to assume. So what is their role then? What did, what is their role in our evolution? It depends on the one. Yeah. So let's go, let's go. I'll just, I'll give an overview, but it, I mean, it's important for people who are watching this to know that we're greatly simplifying concepts for the sake of, you know, people being able to understand things. So yeah, this is like in and of itself, its own a rabbit hole, but I might take a you a little ways down the rabbit hole. Okay. Just, we'll start here and we'll just see how many people we can keep on board. See how long I can stay on board. Okay. Oh, I think you have a great capacity for that one. <laughs> um, all right. So with, when it comes to extraterrestrials, it's a, it's really like across the map, what level of consciousness these beings have and what role they're playing within the greater universe. 
you have what we call a malevolent being. Universally speaking, is not necessarily a malevolent being, and this is what's hard for people to grasp. Mm. And the way that I kind of spell this is, I can have an argument about this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just throw this out. It's not a perfect example, but you've probably heard people saying it's really important for us to weed a certain population of species out here, otherwise the Earth's gonna get in trouble. Do you think that we are the villain to that species or the victor, even though we see ourselves this way? That we're the villain, right? We're the bad guy. We're the one that's I coming in so. and saying, I get to I feel like we're wrecking a lot of things. We are, but like we see ourselves oftentimes as, as doing something beneficial, whereas that's not what is being perceived by whatever species is doing their thing. Oh. So, so the first story that I'm going to essentially tell you about is this, the story where there's extraterrestrial beings who are considered like universal scavengers or part of the universal immune system. Okay. Now, if you have a species that is behaving like a bacterial infection, then it gets targeted by the immune system of the universe at large, which just so happens to be, you know, that we could consider like a T cell within source to be one of these extraterrestrial beings. So they, they essentially target a species that's so acting in its own best interest against the rest of the system that it comes in and essentially tries to take it out. Hmm. At the same time as you have an extraterrestrial being who's like, you know what, there's so much value in humanity, we can make humanity choose. So even they are playing into this choice point where you've got, you know, these extraterrestrial beings who are trying to prove that the human race has essentially gone rogue and is a cleanup species, meaning mm -hmm. it's we have to take out of the picture of the rest of the system. Because uh, to be honest with you right now, the amount of collective asking from Earth, from other species, plant kingdom, mineral kingdom, animal kingdom that are asking for us to go is huge. It's like a <laughs> signal throughout the universe, right? Not good. At the same time as you're having like a whole, 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 like other, you know, form of extraterrestrial beings, and this is more complicated, which have reached this level of awareness in general, where they understand that there is nothing in the universe that is not it. And so when there's this distress call being made by things around a being that you also are, there's an inherent desire to bring that aspect back into alignment because you don't see it as separate to oneself. <laughs> so there's essentially a war, this bigger war being waged over humanity, but it's not a traditional war. It's the war over what will they choose if there's influence. So you've got these extraterrestrial beings trying to influence humanity to like prove that you know, they, are, they are a garbage species, essentially, that's causing problems in the greater universe and world. And you know, this whole group, which is trying to put influence on humans to, to prove that they're capable of being like, wait, I'm not going to act like a cancer cell. I'm going to tune back into the system and essentially create a win-win, which they're so capable of doing. So how, how do these fighter T cells or whatever we want to call them, how do they get us to try and essentially be wiped out? Manipulating the media. But what's important to know is they're not controlling people. They're putting pressure on people. Th these extraterrestrial beings, no matter, it doesn't matter what ET you talk to, right? All of them understand the concept of free will and choice. All mm -hmm. of them have to operate within this you know, the primary laws that govern our universe, like law of attraction, which is why, you know, you, there's no such thing as like a, a, what we call a gray. There's no such thing as a, a gray alien is from Zeta Reticuli. There's no such thing as them coming in and doing an abduction on somebody who hasn't already experienced some form of powerlessness at the hands of an abuser or whatever. It doesn't happen. Mm. So they're still, they're operating within, you know, the, the rules within this greater universe. They can't not, they understand choice. So. So it's like they are not able to control you, neither. They're able to influence. So they're going to influence through, you know, anything that makes the humanity go towards the ego, things like fear, things like, you know, greed, things like envy, you know, all of these experiences that can catch people and cause them to, you know, separate at the same time as you've got the other ones who are essentially like, no, love, no, tune into people. No, you know. <laughs> And we're kind yeah. of seeing where humanity Feel goes. Feel yourself. Feel your emotions. Yeah. Like, I don't have time. I got this other thing going on. I'm, <laughs> my ego's calling. Yeah. It feels like an ego game. It feels like uh, I think about this war within myself of, you know, the, the ego is really impatient 
and it's all the the gimme now and protect myself. I mean, I think there's a positive role for the ego too, because it's Usually. just learned from a young age that if certain things play out in life, it might go poorly. And since we're an efficiency machine, we just know how to negate against it and keep ourselves happy in this very little moment, even though next week or next year or 10 years down the road, you're really super screwed. Um, <laughs> and that on the other side of it, the, 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 the benevolent voice, the ones that want to see us succeed, it's quiet, right? That's a much more quiet voice. It's a much less pushy. It's, um, it's not anxious. It, it, that dynamic is hard that, 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 that it's a, the ego game. That is a, that is a, that is a clawing game. And in fact, it makes me think of certain times where I feel like I've had egoic deaths along the way. There's a, like a, like a one or two rounds of like a last chance clawing. And it really seems like that where these weird, like talons come out and you <laughs> say and do things that you're like, what the hell was that? Like yeah. I've made so much progress. That was terrible. <laughs> and it feels like there's like this vicious coming for you. And is that, is that a phase that we're in where we just need to like endure this sort of vicious phase that's happening where this no. division and this sort of choice game is really challenging. We have to embrace the fact that there is this massive challenge of the pressure cooker of this awakening that I'm describing. But what, what we must do is to aggressively love the ego. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what nobody's doing. And it's a struggle for me, even because, you know, English language, again, when I'm here telling you that the ego is doing something super bad, the natural reflection for a human is to be like, all right, then we got to push the ego away. Mm -hmm. well, that's how it wins right there. And, and it's not even about a wing losing game. The ego is incredibly beneficial, but unless we really spend time to understand it and, and figure out how to meet its needs. And by doing so come in as a kind of like, you know, I'm caretaking the ego as a tool of my own rather than it's this mm. thing that runs me. We're not going to be able to make this transition happen. How do we do that? How do we, how do we make friends with the ego? How do we love the ego? How do we understand the ego? You understand the value of having a self. You understand the value of the aspects of self. And by virtue of understanding the value, you know what place to put it in, you know? Mm. I think the recognition of the ego is the first step. You know, most people, it's like, it's a very complicated pro, you know, practice. It's like, you can look at Buddhist monks, for example. You've got people who have taken themselves out of society, put themselves in a monastery, and they're practicing this for 80 years straight. So it's even more difficult when you're in the world and you've got so many triggers for the ego. But the recognition of the ego, which is this perception of separate self, is the first step to recognize when any aspect of you is fighting for self in any way. And to not make that wrong, it's just the recognition, you know, and mm -hmm. that's what we call that, that external witnessing or the, the, the and some people call this detachment or disidentification. Mm -hmm. People say, interesting, I am watching Teal, you know, if I'm doing me, I am watching Teal have a, a reaction to the fact that this person has achieved something I have not achieved. What does that tell me about myself? And it's like, mm -hmm. you're almost approaching it like you would. I don't want to like belittle the ego by saying it's like a child, but there's a very loving way you can approach a child when it's in that state. How, how do I empower the self? So it's not in the state where it's grasping, you know, how do I sit with my emotions to allow myself to understand that the way that it feels makes sense. And it, all of this process causes a calming down of an in integration of the ego. And so what we end up with eventually is the conscious ego, which most people don't, understand as a state that exists. Most people think consciousness is when you get rid of the ego. Right. I think it's the worst thing that we've ever taught, honestly. Wow. Like we're trying to progress to a place where the conscious ego is a choice. Selfhood is a choice. So the, the whole concept of self is something which you can put on and you can take off and you can choose elements of, and you can extract from. And it's this relationship to the selfhood that is very much like, it's not something that's stuck to me. The word that kept coming to mind as you were talking is observer. I think you might've even said observe. And I think of that for my own life. And just when I'm in observer mode, which I want, I'd love for you to talk about that and what that is and how we can access that. I feel so much more peace. And then I started thinking, this is almost feels like almost like reparenting in a way. Like, how would you, if you were 
if we look at the ego as a little child, it, like I'm thinking almost like a reparenting, but you yes. get to do it instead of someone else doing it. Exactly. And of course, you're going to do it in a loving way and everything's going to be okay that they do because it's really just a learning process. Exactly. And that it's exactly like that. It's a reparenting process of the, you know, the aspect of self that is fighting for the self in any moment, but where you, this, there's so many pitfalls. See, it's like the, the next pitfall is <laughs> if, if in that attitude of reparenting, there's any patronization of the ego, it's already mm -hmm. done. See, So it's <laughs> kind of like, I think this is kind of what makes it fun. Don't get me wrong. It sucks a lot, <laughs> but like, it's also what makes it fun is that there's just like, ah, there I was again, you know? just in the act of like, even being in this attitude of like, I'm going to come in and help you. I'm in the ego. God, okay. nah. <laughs> it's like, you keep getting stuck. Yep. It's like you keep, and that this human experience, it's just so fascinating. Okay. Observer. Cause I think this is a hu huge, I've found so much benefit, even, even if I have to actively choose, like, hang on, let me take a deep breath. Let me try and literally, and I literally try and look, I'm just looking at the scenario. I'm from a visual standpoint. I'm, that's how I get the observer. I just observe and I observe myself sitting there and the other person sitting there. And, but how, how can we, like, what is the role of the observer and how can we practice it? And how can we cultivate a more time in that space? When we practice the observer perspective, we're taking in more of the objective truth of a situation. The way to make this make sense is that I want you to imagine that all things in existence, so let's just take people for right now. Like if I have five people in the room right now, the, per the perception from inside, that's the I, the ego, the perception from inside of a subjective perspective is like when we step into one camera lens, like, let no, let's go here. Let's imagine that you've got a telescope. And a telescope is set up here. And then another telescope is set up over there. And another telescope is set up over there. They're all going to be looking at different angles. Mm -hmm. They're all actually right <laughs> from the angle where they are. And the observer, though, is where you are able to step up outside of that to take in a more objective perspective. The one that's capable of saying, ah, that's why this one sees it in this way. That's why this one sees it in this way. And then, you know, ultimately, the even more where this graduates to is the capacity to step into and out of any subjective perspective so as to get the objective overall truth. But th that being aside, because it's one of those really like far down the spiritual road sort of practices, if we have the capacity to not be so attached to our own telescope in a moment, we can zoom up, we will take in more information about the reality of what's happening than we have available to our consciousness in these confines. And that information changes everything. I mean, everything. And if, it, and if the information changes, it changes the way that we react to a situation. It yeah. changes the actions we ultimately take. I feel like almost like I was just thinking about our own inner lens, like a telescope or a camera or anything like that, right? We have our own personal lens. And I was thinking, I feel like it's like the lens is like the ego, but it's, it's great. Cause it's spotlighting stuff. It's like checking it out really closely. It's like, hang yes. on, alert, alert. And yes. it's like huge. It's like, no, that's an ant. It's not a problem. Um, <laughs> and that, and that the, the observer is playing like the, 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 the ego and the observer connect because there's still information and it feels yes. like our lens the ego is really important to see what's yes, going yes. on and scan, but the observer goes, no, little, little Timmy, it's okay. It's, it's just an ant. It's, it's, it's little Timmy. Let me give you some, well, that's sort of condescending. See, so there we are again, but like, <laughs> damn it, it keeps catching. It, it basically tells the, it tells that aspect of self, here's some information that you don't see yet. Mm -hmm. Right. Which changes the way that, that, that aspect perceives subjective life. But I'm so glad you went here because it's so important to understand that there's different information available at a subjective than an objective perspective. The objective perspective has more of the objective truth. But what's so interesting and what I love the ego about so much is that when you step fully into somebody's subjective perspective, that's a whole other realm of information that comes out of that, you know? And I, I it's like one of my favorite things actually is to spend time in these other subjective perspectives in the universe. Cause it's like, you can't see some of the stuff from a bird's eye view. Like you may be able to see the, the bigger picture better, but like some of those nuances and intricacies you don't see until you're in someone's lens, you know. Now you have a gift for that lens. Yep. You how does someone else do that? 
someone that doesn't have that, you know, that, that level of a gift or that ability to be able to see as easily this human experience is challenging. They commit to understanding above anything else. And I, I'm, I'm sort of dropping these ideas out, understanding that the practice of them is much more difficult than us sitting here and talking about it. <laughs> but it will blow your mind when you start to commit to the practice of understanding how much we don't do this. So it's, it's I mean, to, to approach other people, especially because that's what we're going to primarily be dealing with. I want to start there and have people graduate out from there, right? We're going to start with people. For me to walk into any circumstance and, and be in a space of understanding, I have to take the aspect of me that wants to be understood. It's still a very important part and sort of table it for a minute. Because if it's like, I want you to understand me, then I, it's, it's, I'm not even looking at you, right? I'm just like, this is what I need you to know. Yeah. You're not even thinking about them. Your, no. your mind is somewhere else. They could yeah. be talking and you don't even know because your train of thought is... With understanding, it's the opposite type of mentality. You're walking in, trying to, and wanting all the information. Mm -hmm. And I'm, when I say all the information, I mean on all levels. I want to be able to feel it. I want to be able to see it. I want to be able to hear it. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to conceptualize of it. And if that's a, a goal of mine, then I must first perceive there to be some personal benefit for doing so. And there always is. Once you get to that place of like, there's a personal benefit in understanding, it's like you're open, you're walking in almost like the exalted form of a scientist where it's like, the first thing that I want to do is to see more, is to hear more, yeah. is to feel more. And then you start this process of like asking questions. And through that process, even if you can't, you know, do what someone like me can do, which is to literally go out and go into someone, um, what they will be doing is painting a picture of what they're seeing through their lens. Yeah. And then even that, that information changes, even some things I'm doing over here with me, you know, like my truth, I was about to just bring in and slam in your face. Like it changes some of this even. Right. Because I'm seeing things from a more objective perspective that changes the way I deal with you. My understanding of anything changes the way you interact with something, you know, I'm sorry. Anybody who's really good at something knows what this is like. You know, if you lack the understanding, there are mistakes that you will make. If you have the understanding, you're not going to make those mistakes. This leads me into um, relationships and how they really, you know, just thinking about this dynamic, it's plays out. I feel like most, most prevalent in relation relationships. What's the, what is source of, I mean, it might all be the same, but what, is there a specific role for relationships, partnerships? Oh God, there's nothing nothing bigger for self-awareness in existence. Right. And from, from, I mean, I'm going to say, I'm going to even go beyond that because from source perspective, if you ask a person, what is life? Life is nothing more than relationships. What you call my life is my relationship to anything in this existence with me, my relationship to my cup, my relationship to this person, my relationship to my job as a concept. There is nothing that is not relationships. So, you know, if relationships are life, there you go. And life was designed to essentially create self-awareness within source. So no better platform than relationships to learn about oneself. Is that because it's the most, we're the most emotional, we're the most vulnerable? No, it's because we get to see ourselves. And, you know, I, we can talk about relationships between people, but I would, like I'm saying, like relationships is much broader than that. Sure. Yeah, like even the relationship to one's career. I was just going to say someone's job. I mean, that's a huge yeah. thing in people's lives. If your relationship to your job teaches you about yourself, it's only by um, understanding oneself in that circumstance where we're put in the position to have to, that you can even progress in a relationship, whether that's with your career or with another person. Mm -hmm. It's quite brilliant when you think about it. Mm -hmm. I wish it felt better sometimes. I mean, I, I'm eternally fascinated by the you know concept of soul groups and twin flames and soulmates and, and all of that. And what kind of energy is that in the universe? Wow. All right. So remember how we were talking about these fractals. So you can, you can treat anything in the universe as a singularity. You can, so like, let's say that like, I, I look at you most of the time. I don't, but like, and the average person looks at you as an eye, as a thing. Mm -hmm. That's not technically the truth of you. You are more like an ecosystem that we are calling by one name. And this just this fractal concept just keeps going out and out and out and out. So when we talk about a soul family, we're calling it by one name, but it's a system of beings. 
And they all resonate at a specific frequency, which is why they can be grouped together. But we're essentially creating these groups by witnessing them. It's not like they exist in and of themselves. You know, mm -hmm. if we look at the whole ocean and we say, oh, this is the East Australian current, it's like, but it's the ocean. Yeah, it's something we're creating a differentiation between this aspect of the ocean and other aspects of the ocean. Uh -huh. It's inherently like something that we are doing. But let's say that there are qualities that make it so we can group it in that way. And if for like for the current, it's like, well, we can see that here all of the, the water's going this way instead of this way. And that's what makes this different than this. So anytime we're talking about, you know, these soul groups or whatever it is on that level, we're treating a, a system as if it's one entity. And that overall entity in and of itself will have like an intention oftentimes or a purpose, the same as a human would have spontaneously arrives is this some agreement before you incarnate is oh this... it's always an agreement when we're talking about soul families and all these types of it's always before you came in what does that look like the process of deciding things before you come into this life yeah oh it's very difficult for a for a human mind well, i'm going to try to get you as close as i can because one thing we have to understand is that the human mind has, has its limits and it was actually designed to have its limits like it was designed to plug into the physical time space reality in a very specific way because that perception benefits it. But of course, there's like a downside to that, which is it's very difficult for a human mind, for example, that is designed to perceive time, which is linearity, to understand the concept of there is no there is no linear anything in the universe. See, that's hard. Like I can talk about it as a concept, but it's very hard to kind of, yeah, yeah. and that experience before coming into this life is the same thing because when you die, your the stream of energy which you have identified as yourself it withdraws from the physical and it mm -hmm. also withdraws from what we would call a thought form so that now it is essentially part of you know the source construct again and so it is in this incredibly objective perspective mm -hmm. and it, it's i'm not going to be able to get a person with a human brain translating this experience to understand what the objective perspective of source is like my you know i can just get us close because from that place, there is there is no identification like you experience it today. And from that perspective, you're not limited like we are limited down here by the human mind. Mm -hmm. So you can look at all of these time uh, space reality potentials as a result of going into anything. So it gets as complicated as let's say that you're looking at your mother and she has 45 viable eggs. Like I, you're, be, you're going to be doing this for like multiple parents at the same time. But just oh. to blow your mind. Yeah. Let's, let's say that you decide to zoom in on just one woman. You're looking at 45 viable eggs, meaning that they're the only potentials that exist in her life with a partner is that there's only 45 eggs that will potentially be fertilized in this woman's lifetime. You're looking at literally at what, what one of those 45 potentials are and what all the potentials branching off from that partner, which she would be a match to at that particular time would be to look at what experience that gives rise to in your life. And, and I'm, I'm just talking about the process of fertilization. Not any other experience she goes through in her life, not the impact or the changes that will be made by virtue of you coming into her body. You can look at all of it at the same time. It's like it's more like a computer just, you know, downloading. What dimension is that? Usually when we're when we're looking at those types of potentials, we're more engaging like at the ninth dimensional frequency rather than 11th or 12th. Mm -hmm. It's just so it's so complicated. Yeah. I mean, what I, mean I, doing, I get what you're saying. Okay. I get what you're saying. And I, I'm just curious. I mean, I, I've had someone, ex someone explain to me, uh, you know, time dimensions and just essentially, well, actually maybe just d explain dimensions. I feel like oh. this is people hear about, you know, 3d, 4d, 5d, but like, is there a way that you can kind of lay out? Um, and how many are there? I'm there are 12 ultimately in this universe. And that 12th dimension is where essentially everything is one again. What's important to know, it's not really important to know what is at each dimension for a person. What's important to know is that how these different dimensional frequencies work is like a, a massive version of that aperture or um, telescope difference that I'm talking to you about. It's like mm -hmm. at these different levels, there is a completely different perceptual reality and different laws that apply. For example, in our time-space reality in the physical dimension, you really are tied to this one incarnation and you will experience the progression over the timeline of your one incarnation. Once we get up to the fourth and fifth dimension, fifth dimension is really where this falls apart. Once you get into the fifth dimension, the concept of time falls apart. And all of a sudden you have access suddenly 
you're still in your own personal timeline, meaning teal, right, in this incarnation. However, you're not limited according to one linear timeline based off of where you are. You can switch. So the way that the fifth dimension works more like is what you see in Back to the Future, only you don't need a car for it. It's that like literally you can go back in time and you can make a different choice and experience a whole different timeline simultaneously. So you get to pick with awareness. Yes. With awareness. With awareness. So you get to pick your inflection points. Wow. Yeah. So like, I mean, there's all, I mean, this is the thing, like I could, for all these different dimensions, there's all these different properties that come with that. (laughs) But what's important for a person who's on the path of spirituality is to understand that accessing these different you know, these different f- frequencies of awareness, which is ultimately what it is, is the capacity to access information at a different, or not just information, experiences and different laws that exist at these different levels. You know, so it's like the limitation goes d- you know, sort of down, 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 the further up you go. And then, you, but you start to see the value in the sort of the folk, we call it focus. So sure. here we experience it as a limitation from the higher dimensionals looking down. We experience mm. that as you choosing a specific focus for a reason, mm. which is really fabulous. Yeah. It, it's another thing that I've thought about a lot is that it's some um, maybe chaos theory is the word for it, where you look at something and it seems disorganized. It seems like chaos, but in my mind, I'm like, I think it's just because you're looking too close. Like (laughs) once you pull back far enough and I, I, you know, everything takes a certain amount of pulling back, but is that true? Yeah. There's no chaos from a, from a higher level at all. You know, the genuine, if you want to say that anything is chaos, it's the state of determinism. That's the chaos, (laughs) but there's a certain order to that. Even it's the most predictable thing. Determinism is the most predictable thing, but that's the chaos because it's it's an action that's absent of free will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> wow. Oh, I just went way up there, didn't I? Okay. No, 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 that's okay. I'm going to ask one last question and it's kind of a selfish one, but I'm just curious and maybe it will resonate with other people out there who have had some experiences, but, um, you know, it's kind of this, you know, experience of something out of body, something some transcendental moment, some spiritual moment, whatever someone wants to give for it. And we'll use me as an example, maybe give some insight to people what they might be experiencing. So I have this experience. I'm going to try and make this short and sweet. Um, I have this experience. I'm in Tulum, Mexico. I have, I meet this dog and I name the dog. And then I say the dog, I think the dog is me. I don't even know why I'm saying this. And that when I'm there, And about three or four days into the trip, um, I go down to the beach and I'm trying to find a place to lay on the beach. And I told my friend I was going to try and find a new spot where there was some sunshine because it was the afternoon. But I've migrated all the way back to the original spot where we, you know, laid all week. And I sat down and this dog sat down next to me. And all of a sudden, I just don't know where I went. And I don't know if my eyes were open, closed. I don't know how long it was, but I had this feeling where there's just like, it felt like an energy shaft, like an energy. It it was, it was just like an energy shaft that went up sort of diagonally from me. And it was this awareness of love. It was this awareness of total and complete, perfect, perfect love. And it wasn't that there was, there was no matter how far I went, no matter how long I was gone, no matter how removed I was from this connection, that it was never gone and it was always okay. And there was, there's no need for forgiveness because there was never judgment in the first place. And then I came to, and I just bawled for like an hour (laughs) and I just, I've never known what it was. It was just the most mystical experience. And maybe other people have had something like that. That was a twin flame. Oh, huh. Okay. So it's, it's important whenever we're having these conversations and we're using a specific word to make sure that you're meaning the same thing as the other person, because a lot of people, they don't use twin flame in the same way that I do. When, when I'm talking about a twin flame relationship, that's essentially a split soul. So one of the hardest things for us to conceptualize of, remember I said, we think of ourselves as the one thing is uh-huh. that these, these streams of consciousness that we identify as the soul function more like water. They can fragment so many times, which is why the conversation about past lives is really a complex one, because in this life, the chances of your soul stream incarnating in only one incarnation is incredibly rare. Most of the time, a person's soul stream is incarnated here and here and here and here and here, and not just as humans. 
Mm. So, so part of that experience when you knew this dog was you is that you understood this was a fragment of your soul stream. Now, th that would have been perfectly planned and orchestrated based off of what was happening prior to that in your life, that this aspect of yourself, this other aspect meets you. And th there is an absolute knowing of what is beyond your singularity in this life. What is built beyond that egoic state is that we are one above this. And so the meeting with that thing caused an instantaneous you're not stuck in this physical dimension. Remember what's outside this dimension where you got all of that awareness through your being and no longer felt alone for the first time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. That's beautiful. Now that dog and then that dog goes, I don't get to hang out. I don't get my twin flame. My twin flame came in as a dog in this life. Well, why does the twin flame? We, we may see this is, this is where I need to sort of like make a, I need to sort of split hairs here because a lot of people are, when they, when they use that word twin flame, they're talking about like a person who you're supposed to be meeting as a mate. Sure. This is not a, like when you get into this higher perspective, that's not necessarily what a twin flame is. I mean, you could, your twin flame could be a grass blade at the same time as another aspect could be a dog at the same time as the next person could be a person. Sometimes your overall intention for coming into this life is that at a certain point you will meet the split soul in the form of the opposite gender. Or if you're, you know, it could be even a homosexual relationship where it's, it's still the split soul. That's a very specific contract though. Like that is a contract that it's not like everybody should be looking for the twin flame. I'll tell you that. Cause it can get just as intense as it can be wonderful. Mm -hmm. you know? Cause it's like, I mean, it's almost like for the people who opt into a romantic relationship with a twin flame element of self, oh, get ready to be triggered off your ass. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where yeah. you're going to be looking at yourself, everything you hate and love, and it's a very explosive relationship. Mm -hmm. But I, I want people to sort of separate this meaning that they add. It's humans that add this concept that a twin flame should always be a, a life mate. Can be something else. Oh, yeah. Oh, and you can even have a twin flame in an antagonist. No, you have many. That's what I'm saying. Many. So it can be a person. It can be a dog. Yeah. But it might be in other dimensions. The likelihood of you and another aspect of you meeting in this life is very in high. this life are very are very high. Very high. Okay. But the question is, are you going to recognize it? Because you know, you you it was very you were very fortunate to be in a position where, in order to have the type of experience you had, you would already have to be on this path enough to be open enough that you could recognize it. Yeah. The recognition doesn't often occur. And so oftentimes, you know, somebody who's in my position, I could be watching, oh, that's another fragment of that person's soul. And they're like, I hate that person, you know, <laughs> or they don't even recognize it. They walk right by the tree. Sure. That was something I actually visually watched in a park in New York <laughs> where like a per there was a tree in Central Park that was literally a fragment of this one person. I have only ever seen that one time, but I mean, just totally oblivious, walked oh. right by the tree and the tree was like reaching. I mean, oh. they're just reaching out towards this woman and it's just me, you know? So you, you just sort of have to be in a frequency to recognize it in the first place. Mm. But I don't, I want people to understand that like that the ultimate dynamic that's happening with the twin flame is that splitting of what we call that soul stream, which means you are genuinely, I mean, in a much more intense way, meeting a version of self, you know, mm. everyone's you at a higher level, but like, that's a really intense sort of focused version of that. And if, and we need to like, we need to remove our, the human meaning we've added to it to understand that we may be interacting with a split aspect of our own soul stream anywhere, you know, and, the, and it's very common that a soul stream will send down multiple aspects of itself into different incarnations at the same timeline. Because think about it, if we're after awareness, uh -huh. isn't it so great to put yourself in this perspective at the same time as this perspective in the same uh -huh. situation? Sure. It's the ultimate learning experience, yeah. but, but learn like growth is painful. Yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for that hope and that beautiful um, understanding and for your wisdom. And um, yeah, I, I'm just really grateful. I've learned a lot from you. Thank you so much. And you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.